walk in. So we're going to make this very informal, and especially because there's only a few people in here, so just talk. I mean, we're, we're Nothing great. scripted at all, just yeah, it's like Q and We're just going to give you a little brief overview of what we did, and then and we've done this a couple times before, and we'll just start talking. Everybody can just chat. And uh, we have another expert over here, Josh from Red, Red Blue Voice, so he can give the, uh, the non-profit uh, side of things, and we'll just... Yeah, go from there. So to start, we'll give you a little idea of who we are. First of all, I'm Mike. I'm Dave. I'm Brian. And we are three partners of So Helmet. So here, we'll just give you a quick little video to show you who we are. In the relentless pursuit of the perfect iPhone protective case, fertile minds of the world's greatest engineers have pursuit of the perfect iPhone protective case. Fertile minds of the world's greatest engineers have inspired creativity, imagination, and true genius. Manufacturers have dared their customers to put their product to the test. <coughs> Promises, not to mention cell phones. <laughs> but now, one company has set out to change the game with an idea so simple it's almost hard to imagine. Protection for your iPhone, guaranteed. Strap on the new cell helmet, and if you break it, we'll fix it. Yes, guaranteed. A slim, pocketable design with a protection guarantee? Yeah, when pigs fly. <laughs> All right, so that, that gives you a little bit of a background of uh, what it is that we do. Um, <coughs> We had this great idea, We're like, you know, let's create, first of all, we, we started as cellpink.com. We've been selling cell phone accessories online for the past three years. Um, we had this idea, rather than selling cell phone accessories, let's, let's start narrowing down on our own niche. And we thought, let's create the most indestructible iPhone case. So we started creating this cell phone case, and we're putting like titanium pins in it and making like, this big massive block, and it was pointless. No one was going to want our case. It was absolutely stupid. We were basically recreating something that was already on the shelf. So we narrowed down on our idea a little bit and thought, you know what? Why don't we make a really slim and sleek case and not make it indestructible, but just do something that no one else has done before and slap a guarantee on it and say, if your phone does break inside of our case, we're going to repair or replace it for 50 bucks. Um, no one had ever done it before, and it was a pretty cool idea. So I said, the hell with it. Let's go with it. And, but the problem was, is no one knew this concept, no one knew this idea, and we needed to basically put some legitimacy on the idea. And we started looking at how we were going to launch the, the idea, and we decided upon Kickstarter. Um, what better way than the biggest crowdfunding site that's out there right now? So, uh, we launched Selma <laughs> Kickstarter. When did we launch it? Yeah, fe uh, yeah. We, we launched a forty a forty day campaign on Kickstarter back in February. Um, we had an initial goal of raising ten thousand dollars. And who I'm assuming you guys all know what crowdfunding is. And that's why we're here. Um, anybody here that's interested in crowdfunding? Okay, good, good. So yeah, we threw up a forty day campaign. Um, we really had no idea what was going to happen. We've never been involved with crowdfunding. Um, we had a $10,000 goal. We were basically funding the rest of the project. And we ended up raising 19, a little over $19,000 in 40 days. So not, I mean, we, we weren't like uh, the Pebble Watch. We didn't raise $10 million, but it, it was a pretty good run. Um, more important than <coughs> raising the money, though, crowdfunding was amazing for raising a community. Uh, we manufacture in the Pittsburgh area, and the community we built in the Pittsburgh area and the people we had behind us was so huge for us. And to be honest, looking back at it, uh, we wish we would have done things a little bit differently and, and changed the, our, our reward levels, uh, basically to build more of a community rather than to build funds. So, someone else jump in here. Basically, if you have a goal to get on Kickstarter, prepare to dedicate your life to Kickstarter. Prior like the whole build up to Kickstarter, that, that was a full time job amongst itself. There's the certification process, you have to have everything planned out and show Kickstarter that you truly have a product and an idea behind you. 
behind what you want to invent, basically. Once that's once we got um, accepted, that's when the the real work began. A lot of people think, oh, okay, I got on Kickstarter, I can just let it sit, and the money will just start to roll in. That's the exact opposite of what it is. <coughs> we we contacted people 10 to 12 hours a day about our idea. I mean, there's millions of iPhone cases out there. This is the only one with the hook that if your phone breaks in this case, we will fix or replace your iPhone. We're, we're currently in, in, in the works of releasing one for the iPhone 5. That's a few weeks away from pre-sale. But with this one here, this was months and months and months in the making. In Kickstarter, it was, like I said, it was 10 to 12 hour days. We were contacting blogs, tech blogs, newspapers, um, magazines, television, and a lot of people told us no. But some of those people that also told us no also came back and said, yes, now it's time we want to give you guys a story. Because we were the only people in the, in the world to do what, what, what we're doing. And it's just, it's dedication, you have to be dedicated, and you, it's a numbers game. You, you, you can't take no for an answer. If someone tells you no, that just means they're telling you no today. Tomorrow they, they might need to, uh, a story to write about. And a great example we have is the very first day we were on Kickstarter, Mike reached out to somebody at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He really didn't give us any time today. He said, ah, I'm not interested. Mike, as well as all of us, we politely reach back and update people in, in, in the industry. We don't spam them. We don't say, hey, we have this great thing. Write about us. Let's use your connections. We politely, we build relationships with, with, this, with these writers. We're, we're interested in what they write about, so we talk about what they've written about that isn't. This doesn't even have to do with us. So Mike would keep, a guy, keep the guy updated. <coughs> Several months later, he called and said, Mike, I'm ready to give you some ink. And the very next day, we were on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer business page. That's one of the biggest, biggest newspapers in the country, and it was, it was great. One thing that we definitely noticed is since we do, I mean, our specific thing is cell phones, <coughs> iPhone cases. When you target your target market, we went after, I mean, we try to go after everybody that had some sort of relationship to using the case for their iPhone. Um, one of the biggest things we noticed is we went after writers that wrote similar articles about cases, breaking your phone, anything that could possibly be tied into what our case could do and how it could help the customer. So a lot of people, like I found an article, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of CNET, I found an article by a guy named Rick Reuter and he wrote about a, his blog is Cheapskate, how to like fix your products for a cheap price and I contacted him because he did an article about how to fix your iPhone at home so you don't have to pay like $150 to get it fixed. So I emailed him and said, hey Rick, we have this new product, I think you'd be interested because you wrote this article prior to. And he said, yeah, uh, this is a great idea, give me a week and I'll throw it up online. Sure enough, a week later, he wrote the article, put it up online, it got a whole bunch of traffic. That was post Kickstarter, but I mean, the traffic that comes in from people like that is just, it's invaluable. I mean, you create that community off I mean, we did a lot of Pittsburgh-based pushing, doing networking and stuff like that, but to reach out to like internationally and stuff like that, <laughs> it's just very, very good support, especially since you're finding people that are interested in what your product does and want to buy it, or if you're doing a nonprofit, want to fund what you're doing. And so, keep going. I, I think the, the point here is uh, getting on a Kickstarter is not, does not mean that you're gonna have money right away. Uh, build your connections and build your connections before you start to crowdfund and have them ready to go. I think we had a list of about 2,000 publications prior to putting up our campaign on Kickstarter and we reached out to all of them within the first two days. Then we reached out to all of them within the next five days. Then we reached out to all of them again within the next 10 days. Um, but uh, it, it truly is a numbers game so get ready to build your connections and utilize them. So, I mean, that's basically what we did, and I think maybe if we can, if anybody in here has ideas of what they're going to do, question. you have a question, right? Oh, uh, yeah, I was, I kind of wanted to uh, know about, like, how you structured the um, rewards, what, what do you call it, like, the, the reward the levels? Yeah, the reward levels, and okay. how you yeah, found scroll. the aftermath of, like, filling well, that. Well, we like, actually, <clears throat> after we did this, we wish we would have had a lower reward mm -hmm. level, just to gain more of that community, like our first reward so 20 level was, was twenty too bucks. High, you felt? Yeah, we, I think we, we all think our first reward reward level reward level at twenty dollars was too high. Oh. We we wish we would have had one at one or five dollars.
just to get more of the community behind us. I, I think what, okay, so what happened is, what we, we're, we're looking for that low level, and we thought, you know, let's, let's just throw out a t-shirt, and let's put it at 20 bucks, because if we put it at 10, $10 really isn't gonna do anything for us, let's put it at 20. Um, go, looking back <coughs> at it, I wish we would've sold the t-shirt for $3, and, and, and just broke even on it, just to build more of a community. Um, what we did is, I mean, our, our case uh, MSRP is for the forty-four ninety-nine. Um, we we sold one of the first cell helmets. We pre-sold it for forty dollars. Uh, you could buy two of them for seventy-five dollars. Uh, so we gave a little bit of a discount. The, the issue with ours is we do have the repair and replacement aspect of the product built into the back end, so we couldn't like start slashing prices by like seventy-five percent. But um, does that answer your question? Yeah, and then like after, like how is the whole coordination of like fulfilling all that? It's it's pretty simple. Uh, Kickstarter in particular, uh, and and Indiegogo. It's a little more confusing than Indiegogo, but uh, Kickstarter basically gives you a back end mm -hmm. where you have access to all of your backers. Um, the day that you hit the, the last day of your campaign, mm -hmm. you'll get all that data exported out to you, um, okay. and. You can basically just export a file of all the names, addresses, and what those people funded you for. Basically, you have, at the end, you create a survey, and if any of you have funded anything on Kickstarter, once the campaign is over, you send out that survey so you can get all their information for whatever level they apply for. So, say for ours, they had, um, they got a t-shirt, or, I mean, they got a cell helmet, we'd say, what color, where do you live, okay. all that stuff. So prior to, they know what level they're going to get, and of course during the campaign, if they want, they can bump up to the next level, but during that survey is when you find out all the information. One of the most important things about Kickstarter is the people are supporting you on something that doesn't exist yet. It's an idea. So the most important thing that we found is you can give updates to your backers. We had a 40-day campaign. People told us that we gave more updates than anybody they've ever seen. They, they love that. We updated them along every step of the way. We updated them on when our mold was being done, when it was being shipped here, when when we had a few problems with the mold. We updated them and we were completely transparent with our problems and we told them, hey, we, we, you know, there might be a week or two delay, we appreciate it, just stick with us. And people really seem to appreciate that. That's the catch-22 of crowdfunding. There's a lot of companies and individuals out there that throw up a project and they have no real-world experience. They I have absolutely no idea. There's a lot of Kickstarter projects, and Indiegogo projects, etc., that fail, and they don't even hand out the hand out their their, their promises. Um, so I think our biggest suggestion is if you're going to run a campaign, make sure number one you're asking for enough money, and you're going to be able to fulfill your promises. Because I think the biggest the biggest problem is when you can't fulfill a promise you made to someone that. Uh, I, I, that can be pretty damaging on your, <laughs> on your uh, You're going to see stuff on like, probably like the internet. It's like, I don't like this person. I never got my <clears throat> cord or case or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So. And did, um, do you, do you feel like it was worth it? At the end yeah. of the day? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, the best thing we ever did for this project in particular was Kickstarter because it truly did kickstart us. Um, like I said, we needed legitimacy because we were three guys in a, in, a, in a little building selling a case that comes with a repair built into it. Um, we got a lot of articles while we were on Kickstarter and it just compounded upon itself after Kickstarter. Um, it really did help us to kickstart <laughs> the business. Yeah, because like, the same have a question, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, actually I had two at one. one. Uh, does Kickstart get a cut? Yeah, yeah. It's, they take a, a very minor percent. It's five percent. It's five percent, and then you're paying. I think it's three percent. It's between two and three percent for credit card processing. And the other stuff. one was more about your business model. How do you prevent someone from breaking their phones and buying from your cases? Um, from a business model standpoint, uh, <laughs> it's it's a very uh, what's the word? I'm thinking of. 
It's a calculated risk. Very calculated, yes. We went into it. Our we business know, models are very calculated risk. Yeah. Um, we have, we have, we have, we have we dug into all the stats, which are available to everybody on Square Trade, basically on, on in it, as far as um, someone taking advantage of it and being fr fraud, I mean, that happens, but we have, uh, our case retails for forty four ninety nine, and there is, there's a $50 handling fee when you file a claim to get your phone replaced. And the average repair price for us, including overnighting it back to the customer, is $77. So at that point, we're still being profitable. But compared to the insurance industry, where you pay $10 a month for your iPhone insurance, and then if you do break your phone, you have a $200 deductible. Oh, <laughs> just it doesn't make sense. It's a no-brainer. No yeah. But uh, yeah, our, our business model is pretty solid. So, uh, so Nick, you were saying that you had this cascade of, of growth as far as media mm -hmm. marketing kind of concerned. You see the viability of, a, of a, something that you necessarily don't think may, may actually complete its Kickstarter campaign as long as you do all the prerequisite work to get the exposure. Wait, so it's fine. So say say you start a Kickstarter campaign and you know <coughs> anything else you're making a gamble on this. Yep. So say you, you have a, an accept, expectation that you probably won't complete your campaign, as in that you won't reach a funding level. Okay. Um, do all the prerequisite work, contacting and making connections, and then the exposure of being on Kickstarter, is that a, do you think that's enough to be uh, almost profitable after the fact? If you didn't hit your goal? Yeah, if you didn't hit your goal, oh. get enough exposure, it, like it, then almost abusing it in the sense that it's it's open, it's out there. I mean, the community that you build from it yeah. is probably something like, we've heard stories about people who've gone on Kickstarter and they haven't hit their goal, but once the goal doesn't hit, people find, like email them back saying, "Hey, we really support your pro project. If there's anything, like tell us when you have like a pre-sale or whatever." Right. There's also other things you can do. Like if you did one a site specific for your product and you put it up there for pre-sale, you have those people come back to you because they're already dedicated to whatever you're making. So there is definitely opportunity. And Kickstarter, I guess, it's a very good area because you are targeting people that want to. They seek out neat ideas, right. and for like pricing your product really low. I mean, these are people that have vested interests, so they're first movers. They're, they're willing to pay a little more. So I mean, you could probably capitalize even if you don't hit your goal off the people that already backed you through a preset. Right. But are you gonna dominate the world off of press off of Kickstarter? I mean, it, it really it, it all depends on what you put into it. You're gonna get out of it what you put into that's it. What, that's what. That's pretty much I guess the question I'm asking. Because we're looking at a software project, which is somewhat light on Kickstarter. Okay. And so there's a, what I feel, probably just because of ex the, the amount of people looking for them on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, don't expect to throw it on Kickstarter and people to be looking for it. Oh, exactly. And, and, and people to just flood your campaign. You're really going to have to push traffic to your campaign. It's more or less just a medium right. to, to pre-sell to pre your product. Cool. I like on Kickstarter, Kickstarter, if you set a goal, like our goal is 10,000. Like let's say the campaign ended and it was at $9,000. We don't get any of that money. Oh, absolutely. But another crowdfunding uh, website that we've used before is Indiegogo.com. On there, you get you have the choice to select. Even if you don't reach your full goal, you still get some. You still get the funds okay. if you fell if you fall short. But uh, but of course the community on there isn't as close to as popular as Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so, did you do the t-shirts specifically for this project? Did you already have? We had other, we had other t-shirts. Um, but like, is that, did you decide like, okay, t-shirts is going to be one of my, our things? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, um, like you said, there's a lot of certification stuff beforehand. Like, what's the time frame? Was yeah. it like months? It's not really no. a certification. Weeks? It's basically, it's an application process. Uh, yeah. You're going to fill out an application, submit it. I mean, we heard back in about 36 hours. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. They have rules that they have set up, guidelines. They're very broad. So yeah, they, they submit, broad. and if you hit any of those, I honestly think it depends on their mood, but if you hit any <laughs> of their guidelines that they don't like, then they'll say, hey, sorry, you can adjust your campaign accordingly to try to resubmit. Okay. But you only get two tries on your yeah. project. Okay. And they won't, they won't ever exactly tell you what you need to change. Yeah, that would be... The Kickstarter <laughs> communication is absolutely it's horrible. There's, it no, is there's no phone number. You cannot call them. Uh, email support is mostly automated. You send an email to Kickstarter, you'll get an automated response. 
and then you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the email to see where it says, uh, if this does not fulfill, or if this does not answer your question, reply to this. <laughs> Unless you get in trouble, then they'll send you a personal one. We had, during our first week, we were yeah, yeah. tweeting. I mean, we all, we should have done this a long time ago, which you guys probably all have Twitters and stuff, but we just, we got cell pig, well, cell home and Mike, cell home and Dave, and cell home and Brian. So we were tweeting at writers and trying to get in contact that way, since Twitter is such a good medium to like break that barrier to get in contact. And we were tweeting out articles left and right, like, hey, check out our project. And soon enough, we got a message from Kickstarter saying, stop spamming people or we'll shut you down. Uh, we weren't really spamming yeah. people, but at we were informing them. So they're trying to like, protect <laughs> them. So exactly. <laughs> they, do, they do keep tracks of, of the web and see how many spaces your link is going to have. And you can so, be careful. Yeah, we met somebody who did something like that, and they just they told us, yeah, we just got shut down right away. So, but it, like we noticed, if there's an article about you that you get a writer to do, like you retweet it because your people are gonna see it. Right. And yeah, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to use Twitter. Right. Just yeah. So from the time you put in the application to the time it was live was <clears throat> roughly. It's entirely up to you. They'll give you like they'll say your project has been accepted, and okay. it'll be in your email and. From that point, you can either hit that green button to go, the or launch button. Yeah, okay. you can let it sit, and you can finalize everything to make it perfect. Okay. So you basically build you. the campaign prior to to submitting, okay. um, so you're going to basically be about ready at that point. I mean, you might want to fine tune it, but okay. it's one, completely up to you. One thing we really regret is that we didn't. Our Kickstarter video was. Just in there. Awful. <laughs> it was so was, bad. What? Five people talking in a room that echoed. It was all wood <laughs> floors. It was terrible. No one wanted to watch it. We didn't even want to watch it. <laughs> so that's one thing. If you see a lot of these Kickstarter projects, I mean, that video is really like an attention grabber. Right. And just, I don't know, two, three minutes is something that people will enjoy watching. Like, I don't know, when Apple launches their new device, they put out their keynote video or whatever. It's like three or four minutes of them talking how awesome and sexy their phone is compared to everyone and people watch it we our were, video not so much we kind of <laughs> we, we didn't we were kind of ignorant going into kickstarter we really didn't know what we should be doing so we, we kind of just re, we, we looked at some campaigns that we saw were successful and we're like oh let's let's follow that video idea we didn't really do anything unique there was one guy his name's scott wilson he's done quite a few projects on kickstarter and he's been very successful but he has a very big community built behind him. So when he launches a product, it'll go up to like over $100,000 within the first week. We didn't have that community built prior to, which, I mean, we had some connections through family and friends, but we'd go out and meet with people now and discuss what their experiences are and what they did better than us. And it's just kind of neat to compare and contrast what worked for them, what worked for us. And it's all about community at the end of the day. And I think everybody in this room completely agrees and understands and does such a thing, but networking is probably the best thing you can do in the face of this earth. So um, the video we saw, when did that come about? That was recent. That, that was, was like two months ago? Yeah, a couple months ago. That was our true first money we put into advertising. That cost us about $3,000. Before that, it's been all guerrilla marketing, contacting people relentlessly through the web, phone, email. Now, how did you network locally, eliminating your friends and family differently than you did nationally and internationally? Um, we, we, number one, we never turned down a, an offer, for, an opportunity for, for a meeting. Um, so, if anybody ever wants to do lunch, let us know. But, um, yeah, I mean, we use Twitter a lot. Um, and basically, you got to find the, the heavy hitters that you know are are the good people to know, and you got to find a way to get to those people. Um, Sally Ligon, we knew she was a she was a big one. Um, we had to find the way to get to Sally Ligon, so we started working out the angles. We eventually got to her, and we, she eventually did a, uh, did a, a thing on us. Yeah, she came out to her office. It was pretty cool. But uh, you basically got to find, look at the, the top, the people you want to you want you need to speak to, and figure out how to get to them. I mean, I think you know that pretty well. We had a uh, article done by Mashable, and we got the connection through. Uh, what's 
Noah Kravitz. Noah Kravitz, who's a big tech writer. And uh, he passed this along to Emily Price, who did the article. And we notice if, if one of those articles gets published to a million, a few million a day hits site, it just trickles down everywhere. And from that, we got, it's like a connect the dots. It went from Mashable to Gizmodo to Fox News to just kept going and going. And then it, eventually, it goes down to the smaller blogs. But if you can, we, our goal at first was to aim high and try to get one of those key people to write about us. So when we launched, we had a lot more legitimacy than starting low and building ourselves up. But never, ever, if someone wants to write an article about you, give them the time and the attention, because you never know who's reading it or who's paying attention. I think the biggest suggestion is focus for the top and devote the most time and energy towards getting those key articles, those key, the, the key attention, because that's what's going to trickle down. Um, and the most important thing is, yeah, it's awesome if you tweet about your own stuff all day long, put your own stuff on Facebook, but when someone else, especially somebody who writes for some, something, talks about you, that's, that's, that's what you want. You want something. You want other people talking about it. That helps establish your legitim legitimacy a lot more than you just saying all day, mm -hmm. hey, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this. <laughs> or help fund this, give me money. So do you have a particular campaign that you're... Yeah, um, so my husband and I are in the process of buying a farm. Okay. We, we farm right now on other land, and, um, but we're going to buy our own. And so we're probably going to need some startup money for like tractors and that type of yep. thing. And it, we're cut several months out of this, but um, it's something we've thought about and I want to just kind of get in front of people when I saw your session to kind of talk to someone who yep. actually you know, did it. Um, what, one thing I'm struggling with is kind of what to give people. Um, I've kind of come up with some different ideas, but since it's a farm, like, you know, we've talked about like farm dinners and stuff, but I want to be careful not to put, end up being too much on us, like taxing us too much right. as well. So, yeah, and you even, even the t-shirt, I didn't even think of like, we could make up like cool fun, like, you know, Farmer's Rock t-shirts or something like yeah. that, you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it, that was a, that's a good idea, it's kind of a low level. Now, Kickstarter in particular is, a little more strict than all the others. Um, you have to have a, a, an end concept, an end goal uh, that you're going to provide to the, your backer. So Kickstarter may not be the, the, the right avenue okay. for this type of campaign. Um, maybe Indiegogo, maybe Rich Voice. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. I know you're opening up. Yeah, we're, we're going to do the, the regional project based stuff, but I think we're going to stay with nonprofits for a while right. just because of less legal baggage, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, so I need to look into it. I know other firms have done it, have done similar things. That's where I kind of got the idea, so. Um, you know, Cuba does micro loans to American businesses now, too, uh, which yeah. might be a good opportunity for you guys, because that's in the yeah, niche. Yeah, that's a good idea. No, but, I'm sorry. Well, I, I was thinking of a purpose. I'm <clears throat> thinking about using this fund, <clears throat> starting a, my social media consulting for Ghost tweeting, <laughs> my, my little term. But I'm just going to focus very specific on very small nonprofits and then also political candidates. Um, and I was trying to think of, of perks beyond T-shirts and things like that. And one thing I came up with is the Gay and Lesbian Community Center because I was thinking about building up on my community. That because I'm going to work with them, and I thought that I could donate hours, of, like a half hour of them, for a certain level of donation, so that the donor would be giving something to an the community center in addition to also helping me. I wasn't sure. It's a great idea. Make sure it's scalable. Yeah. Because uh, the last thing you want, uh, or, or maybe what you do is just cap it and say, I'm only willing to give up 10 of those half an hour slots. But just realize, at the end of that campaign, if you promise 100 people a half an hour. Well, no, uh, I would make it, it all goes to that one organization. OK. So okay. You, you donate to me. You. I'm the, that's another half hour for the GLCC, mm. which I would work with them anyway, so it's kind of a win-win. Like really you you, you community couldn't community just that. say, oh, come work with this group, and come, that would be useless. Yeah. Half an hour here, half an hour there. <laughs> I might pick two or three groups, but I was thinking that would kind of have that nonprofit appeal and like a, a, someone who wants to support the gay community, now people who that's not an interest to, but that's, that's my base. But like you said, Pittsburgh Lesbian has a massive crowd already, why wouldn't you utilize it? Yeah. I mean, those are the people that already support you. 
And that's Absolutely. a very good foundation to build off of. I mean, and that could get, I think I could get a lot of national media out of that yeah, too yeah. because it would be unique. Like, oh, support Pittsburgh's community center. I'm There's, sure people in that group know people outside, so it's like the giant networking tree and how to get it back all back to you. We call it the game mafia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Having something unique will help you get uh, publicity. Um, when it comes to your farming project, think it. I would think of the most unique aspect about your project and utilize that to, to, to basically get coverage. Yeah. Um, there has to be something different that you're doing, something yeah. unique. Um, well, my husband's a veteran too, okay. and that we've kind of you know used that. In, I don't want to say angle, like sounds weird, <laughs> but um, I feel like that's kind of a unique that we're both farming and veteran. So, and we have see we have this great community, and that's kind of one thing I'm trying to tap into. We lived in Texas. My husband's from Texas. We lived here. I'm from Buffalo. So we have all these people who like want to buy like buy our produce, obviously. So I'm trying to like tap into that now that we're actually taking on more risk and buying our own property is like ways that people can support us. We can't actually like, come and buy our stuff, you know? I think the veteran angle, it, 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 it is, I mean, it, don't be afraid of saying that. <laughs> That's a great angle. Yeah. I mean, you're appealing to a very big market there. Right. It would make me, because I try <laughs> to believe that supporting veterans back in the United States is living up to that whole support your troops mentality. Yeah. And it drives me nuts when people don't do that. Right. That's the kind of thing. If I read that, I'd, I'd be like, all right. Even if it was ten bucks, I would. Yeah. I would that's, support. And it. it's important. I mean, we felt that's why my husband got an apartment is because he came back and just needed something that he felt like was healing and farm. And it's actually becoming a small little movement of like getting uh, veterans in the farming. So. And it sounds like you could get tons of media. That's because there's Serenity Valley Farm is the name. It's <laughs> called Serenity Valley Farm. Sorry. So we are, we're already up, we're because we farm here, but um, we're going to be just moving up to the Buffalo. Could, could you give us a, per, a percentage of your first crop or something? Yeah, that's a, another thing, like a CSA. Uh, um, I mean a percentage of the crop, I mean a percentage of the money you take in from the crop. Not that I have to pass out the food, but like, a, like, a, like, like an equity stake up there. Yeah, yeah, the rules change. Yeah, right now you can't do that. If you donated produce to um, a veteran's home or something like that, like yeah. that first L level as a per, that's the kind of thing that would appeal to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, if you guys like, do like preserves or something like that. Yeah, that yeah, we do, and that's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've been trying to do that this fall. It's like bottling. Of, we do um, like vinegars too, like basil garden vinegar and something like that. Um, I also have the idea to write um, a, a book about how to use greens because I feel like greens are something that's really like people don't really know how to use them, and they're that's what's in season in the spring and the fall. So like a like just even like an electronic PDF, like get a copy of you know, a greens book. Could you even just send? Um, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I feel like people yeah. that are like into, yeah, like, we're really idea. involved in our CSA, but we live in the city, so we can't really garden and farm where we would like, but I would think that yeah. those same things yeah. people would want to be, you know, in Texas. On that note, on that note, like she said, you could even, even have a higher level where maybe mm -hmm. somebody can even design their own packet of seeds um, and then their, their logo or their like design can be on, on that packet. I would want a tour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Just as simple yeah. As, yeah. Give people the opportunity right. to come out to the farm yeah. and maybe pick some of their own. Yeah. How are you going to actually sell them? Because some, uh, some farms do, you know, like produce subscriptions for people who are in the city and every week you get a package of a certain number of things. Right. And you subscribe at the beginning of the year. The CSA. Model. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's our plan. It's just, you know, we're, we're going to be buying this. And right now, we're hoping to get this one place. Um, but we're just going to be starting. So it's going to take us a bit, you know, to get to that CSA level. I feel like with selling seeds, that's kind of a cool idea because you could brand them your own way. Yeah. That, that veteran spin or whatever you want to do. I mean, that's, that's a really, like, eye catcher for anybody. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good community to tap into. Yeah, I like the seeds idea. And especially the co-op community is really, like, growing right now. Yeah. So that's a very good crowd. And you're just that. starting, so just go to Walmart and buy a whole bunch of seeds. And then <laughs> re repackage them. Horrible. Repackage them as your own. Some GMO seeds. Like, oh, it's yeah. business, man. Yeah. You, you can order bulk <laughs> seeds on, online. And, I'm serious. Just package them as your own. But you know, yeah, we have to be picking work. You know, who has a huge following is on the East End Co-op. Yeah, and we actually know them, those guys over there, pretty well. Um, 
And I can see that they would put a lot of support behind you because that's, they're really using social media pretty well right. for their size. They, they are, are yeah. yeah. And there's one in Buffalo too, there's a Lexington co-op, it's the same network, so. Um, those are great connections, but please get a hundred of those. Yeah. Um, don't, do not rely on just one connection Right. and co-op and expect that to, to, to play, project you because it's not going to happen. Well, one thing that's kind of handy is I work in PR. Okay. <laughs> and that's kind of my freelance. I do that. So when you guys are talking about that, it's like, yeah, that's what you got to do. You know? uh -huh. So um, we've got that kind of, I kind of know, you know, what to do on that end. It's just... Good stuff. So what else do we have? Who else is, that has a, the next big idea? All right, well, jo Josh handles ideas, so explain explain <laughs> what Red Blue Voice does. Well, we started out uh, crowdsourcing political content and advocacy media. So if you are a nonprofit, you can come, throw up your 30 second TV spot. Uh, it was either a PSA or a brand ad, and we would crowdfund its distribution, and we handle all the booking and all the technical formatting, stuff like that. So uh, lecture season is winding down, so we're kind of pivoting. And we're partnering with a, um, well, we're, we're, we're working on a partnership with the local media conglomerate. And um, we're going to do like a regional Kickstarter that's more project based for nonprofits. So if you're a nonprofit that has a need, say $5,000 or less, think of it as kind of like a little mini grant. And you'll have, hopefully, if everything works out like we planned, uh, a portal to come to where you can post your project to the Pittsburgh region and then satisfy it uh, locally and regionally with people that have a vested interest in this community and the things that you do. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you know, come see me, I'll give you a card. Uh, we'll be launching a prototype hopefully here in a couple weeks and uh, we're looking for nonprofits to fill that prototype with projects so we can get some uh, metrics back on, on the success of what we've done well and what we've done poorly. That's what we do. What do you been around for about a year. In terms of nonprofit non projects, do you have some guidelines? Yeah, I have a little guideline sheet for you. It's, it's pretty much just what you'd expect to see on a grant application. Uh, we've abbreviated it. What, what I think is horrible about Kickstarter and Indiegogo is, is the time commitment it takes to spool up the campaign. I mean, you know you have to do all this social networking and labor work to make sure it's successful, but I think there's also, it's overly uh, complicated, the application process. And then Kickstarter can come along and say, meh, not into it, right? So you can put in all these hours and hours, and even just setting up your Amazon.com pay solution. And it took us four days because of bureaucratic mess ups between the two groups of people. So we're trying to make this uh, streamlined as possible so that you can adequately describe to the community what it is you want, what it is you're going to do, why it has value, uh, but also so that it doesn't take you hours and hours and hours to apply for something like this, right? And we're going to try to build in systems uh, in, in the site so that there's a limited number of projects at one time so that there isn't this large, you know, ask to the community. Maybe there's 10, maybe there's 12, and as those get funded, we'll add new ones. Maybe there's always 12, and we'll always keep cycling new ones in. So getting in early would be advantageous to a nonprofit because you'd be first in and helping us hopefully help you. Will you allow the funding of operational? Or uh, the way we're looking at it, five thousand dollars or less, as long as you can make a compelling case of the community, uh, I think that we would, would be down for it. So why is it five thousand or less? Well, uh, I don't know. I think we're just trying to figure out what the point is. Like, what's what's the capital uh, available in the region? You know, like if, if there's two hundred thousand dollars of open projects on the site, maybe, maybe that's too much. Maybe they never get funding. Like, what, what if the Red Cross came in and said, oh, "We love the platform." We'd be, we'd be we would definitely talk <laughs> We also never turned down meeting. Yes, we also never turned down meeting. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we are. It's a crowd, like all these things these guys said is 100% true. Uh, crowdfunding is a tool, and it's not really a lot different than any other fundraising tool that's existed in the last 10,000 years. Uh, you have to go and become part of your community and demonstrate value to your community. And if you don't do those things, no one's going to help. To be honest, <coughs> crowdfunding is like having your own website. Um, yeah. It just so happened when we launched our project, our website, selfmade.com, wasn't massively known. So we use Kickstarter as a, as a means to, I mean, it, there's, it's, a, it's a widely traveled website. Um, 
So uh, as we do our iPhone 5 case, it's going to be available in about a week here uh, for pre-sale. We're not going the route of Kickstarter because now we have that legitimacy built. We have the connections built where we can do our pre-sale on our own site. Um, but it's basically, it's just a place to sell your product and it's just like having a website. Did you guys have to rework your numbers before you got off topic? Did you have to rework your numbers for the iPhone 5? Like, do you have to rethink about your business model every time an iteration comes out? Um, it's a little bit different, but it's not that much off. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so it's pretty similar. This is our new site, sellhelmet.com. We started at sellpig.com. Um, if, if any of you guys have an iPhone 4 or an iPhone 5, you can come here and use the promo code SELL50, C E L L 50 all one word and get 50% off. Oh. That's during, just during the month of October. Yeah. So we just launched this site, so it's kind of like the come and test out our site, Tomorrow. figure out the kinks and get 50% off. When are you moving to Droids? Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that could possibly come out of a partnership at some point, but it's just uh, everything outside of Apple is such is so unstable. Uh, when an Apple, when a new Apple device comes out, it's going to be hot for the next two years. You need a license from Apple? Nope. Nope. We're basically just accessorizing the product and we're utilizing repair facilities across the nation. Um, we have 39 repair facilities that are already sitting there. They're not our facilities. We have uh, contracts, these facilities, and basically just utilizing what's already in the market. So you fix the phone and you send it back to the customer? Yep. Yeah. yep. What's, the, what's the timeline on that? Uh, we guarantee three business days, but most repair, 99% of repairs are done within an hour. We really? ship back that afternoon. Yeah. Huh. So um, as fast as we get the, the device from the customer, that's basically as fast as we'll get it, we'll get it back to the customer. We overnight it back to the customer at our expense. So if we get that phone today at 1 o'clock, yeah. it's most likely going to be fixed by 2 p.m. and it's going to be shipped. They're going to have it tomorrow. So our facilities are pretty quick. That's awesome. Now, is there like a warranty on actual the actual um, case? If the case um, gets like boogered up or anything, call us and we'll send you a new one. If anything ever happens, we get we take care of our customers. Okay. So, so if someone's repaired at one time, is it still? Is yep, it's, it's unlimited. Uh, unlimited it, repairs, it, one it's we, we call it a year of coverage. Um, think the insurance model, but it's not really insurance. But what it is is if if, if you break your phone. Gonna pay a fifty dollar fee. We're gonna repair it. Send it back to you. If you break it again, you're gonna pay a fifty dollar fee. We're gonna repair it. Send it back to you. If we replace your phone, then it does void that that year. Because um, at that point, it's, it's it's a big replacement fee. So, what'd you do with the extra nine thousand? It, it went into the program. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we we put a lot a lot more. I mean, we we were. We had a conservative goal of ten thousand dollars. We put a lot more than ten thousand dollars into this project. It's one so. of those things you ask for so much, but you always. So, why did you decide on forty days? What was the thinking there? The, the Kickstarter averages thirty. Or yeah, they recommend thirty. They recommend thirty. Mm -hmm. Average. Um, we had a little bit more time that we needed ourselves, so we put it out to forty. Mm -hmm. I think your money set aside to satisfy if you came up short. Yeah, we did. So that that's another good point. Um, if you're going to run a campaign, make sure you're ready. Just to, like say you're you're, you're seeking a hundred thousand dollars, and you're at ninety five thousand dollars with three hours to go. Make sure you have five thousand dollars in your back pocket, ready to throw at it, because um, you don't want to lose that ninety five thousand um, dollars. Yeah, good point. Yeah. That's a great. That's a good. Um, there, there was actually a, a, another Pittsburgh company called Shubru. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but they, they launched on Kickstarter. They're building a brewery. Zelianople. Zelianople. And I think they were about $1,000 short for about an hour to go. And they threw $1,000 in just so they could keep their, their funding. Another little trick we learned, let's say we were like almost at $1,000 funding. We would tweet out or put on Facebook, hey, we're almost at $1,000. Who's going to push us over to top? And that actually works. Like people actually yes. want to be that person. Well, that yeah. sounds. It actually does work. It works with followers. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah exactly. you know? People are like, yeah, what the heck, go follow you. <laughs> really did work. Well, it's 10:50 in the city. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right. Any other questions? If anybody walked in late and they didn't get a t-shirt, come up and grab a shirt. We'll love to see you in a cell helmet t-shirt. You'll love to wear it too, trust me. Yeah. Make sure you buy comfortable t-shirts that people want to wear. So if I wear that shirt and put it in my video, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even with my stratosphere. Sure. You know, the <laughs> no, no. no that's another another suggestion. If you're ever buying shirts for your company or whatever it may be, get really, really soft shirts so people want to wear them. Where'd you, where'd you guys get those? Clockwise tees. Clockwise tees. Clockwise tees. Tall tees. Tall tees. Tall tees. Tall tees. Tall tees. Tall tees. We get them for a little under five bucks a piece. Other jewelry. It's, it's really cheap for a shirt that's this nice. Yeah. Our first shirts were like these starchy, like really hard. <laughs> no one wore them. Obviously, they sucked. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys so much. Good luck. Crowd from the world. Crowd from the world. Thanks. That's very helpful. Nice to you. Yeah, I'm still not there. Feel free to get in touch with us if you have any questions or want to do lunch or talk more. Are you Mila? Mila? No. And that discuss for iPhone 4. Okay. I'm sorry? The discuss for the iPhone 4. Yeah, it's for iPhone 4. We have the case. The actual case we have right now.